Good morning, everyone from Toronto, Canada, and good afternoon and good evening to everyone joining us from across the world on Zoom and Facebook Live. Welcome to the Voices Youth webinar on the theme, Ending Nukes and Ending Climate Change, the Ethical Responsibility to Mitigate Negative Human Impact on the Environment. I'm Kehtisha, lead of the Voices Youth team and the founder president of Green Hope Foundation. Voices for a World Free of Nuclear Weapons is composed of dynamic voices from across the political, professional, spiritual, and geographical spectrums who have united in a single purpose to eliminate nuclear weapons once and for all. Now, today's theme has an overwhelming influence on our current and future well-being, and yet for reasons that we hope to find out today remains shrouded possibly more by intent than by design. And that makes the threats even more sinister and potent. Our discussion today will revolve around the threats faced by two monstrosities of our own creation, that of nuclear weapons and climate change both of which are tied together by the immense injustice and suffering that they cause. Both can definitely derail our future irrevocably, and yet their greatest threat lies in the complacency and nonchalance that we at all levels treat them with. And it's as if they are someone else's problem to solve, and it's this apathy that vested interests have exploited for decades for their profiteering. We are now slowly coming out of a period of unprecedented global suffering caused by the COVID-19 virus. And there is a sense now, an understanding, and also a desire to address issues because ignoring those issues can lead to a similar agony. And I think it's this small and fleeting window of opportunity that we seek to leverage, to focus global attention on removing the twin threats of climate change and nuclear weapons. It's about removing the veil and curing the myopia that allows both of these threats to survive and thrive. But change will not come by wishing others to do what we should be doing. It is about self-responsibility and also about calling out those who shirk accountability. It's about collaborating, about mainstreaming these issues, about bringing together the advocacy and outreach of all of civil society, of faith-based and interfaith organizations, governments, and all other stakeholders. And that is why today's discussion is so significant. And we are delighted and honored to have with us two eminent experts whose work has inspired so many and me personally. Just before we continue, I would like to uh, request your audience to put your questions, if you have any, towards uh, the end in the Q&A box, and our panelists would be happy to answer them. And we should also be taking in questions from Facebook Live. So Dr. Mary Evelyn Tucker and Dr. John Allen Grimm, both of whom are senior lecturers and senior research scholars, as well as the co-founders and directors of the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale University. Thank you so much for being with us today. We are really excited to hear your perspectives. So I would like to request Mary Evelyn to take the floor first. So Mary Evelyn, over to you. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be with you and to feel our Canadian, our North American connections. We're thrilled, and especially our intergenerational connections. We like to speak about an intergenerational handshake. And now our students say, how about an intergenerational hug? Um, so we want to have this mutual empowerment. And uh, so we're very honored to be here. Um, I would say, you know, from the beginning that there's an expertise on both these issues, which we would not claim at all, but we're trying to bring together, as are you, the grounds for transformative change for future generations of all species for our living earth community. 
And in that spirit, I want to just begin with some words of thanks, because we have a legacy, don't we, on both these issues. The ancestors are with us. Um, and I want to really call out those who have been peace activists on the nuclear issues for many, many years, especially Dorothy Day and the Catholic Worker Movement and friends in that movement. We'll refer back to that in a moment. But also scientists from the Pugwash Movement that won the Nobel Prize in 85, the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War that also won the Nobel in 95, and the inter -campaign, uh, International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, which has helped foreground this latest treaty uh, from January 2021 on preventing nuclear weapons. I also want to thank educators who have been thinking about this, dedicating their lives to this for many years, including Colleen Driscoll, who was a big help to us in preparing uh, this webinar. She was a political scientist uh, for 25 years in international relations at Villanova, um, a college and university, and also taught at Quinnipiac College here in the New Haven area. You know, in 1972, she was part of a huge demonstration in Washington, D.C. of 270,000 people. That's how yeah. vibrant yeah. this movement was in those days. And she's followed it all these years, especially for the prevention of nuclear weapons in space which is something we hardly have talked about. And for climate change, I wanna give a big shout out to our friend Bill McKibben and 350.org and all those who built this movement from the grassroots up to the climate scientists like Jim Hansen, uh, like Steve Schneider at, at Stanford who's passed away, mm -hmm. but, and Michael Mann at UPenn, at, at State University, uh, State College. Um, so all of these scientists, these activists, and as well, our wonderful colleague, Tony Lyserowitz here at Yale with the Yale Program on Climate Change Communications, people trying to figure out how you communicate this. And finally, the religious community, people like Jim Antel with the UCC and many, many others will highlight some of them as we speak uh, today. But Green Faith is a great partner in this too. So with that sense of legacy, of gratitude to those who are doing this work and have done this work, we'd love to begin with a story from John. Thank you so much, Basu, for this invitation. And I feel the bridging also, as Mary Evelyn mentioned, to those younger who are carrying the fight forward. It's really very encouraging to work together on these issues. And while uh, Mary Evelyn puts it quite clearly, I, I want to uh, re reinstate that I don't feel expertise in this area, but I do feel like I have a story. And I do feel like those that Mary Evelyn mentioned also, we, we share our experiences of these issues and how they come to us personally. And my story begins in North Dakota and in the rural parts there where uh, my family first experienced the nuclear military proliferation in the form of the sighting of a uh, missile base on our family farm. And so my experience of these issues began at the family table where I and I was the last of 10 children and those of us who were still at home and my parents would sit and ponder what it was that was being imposed upon us where a missile base would be sighted adjacent to the family homestead. And as we talked about these issues, I, I began to understand how my parents brought me as a young 12 year old into some understanding of the issues that were going on and they were framed in terms of land and agriculture and farmers who loved that land and who realized the uh, income that came from the sale of farm products and it kept the family going. And so there was this sense of a giving land. One might even say a sacred earth in that sense. And I watched my parents wrestle with these issues then for some years as we talked about it at the table and then would go and visit the family farm together as a family. And I would see my father as he grew ill over these issues. And yet every time we went to the family farm, I could see his vitality return, that sense of the healing dimension of the land. So the community of the family that stretched into the land that was giving to us 
And the fact that it had a healing presence that was being undermined by this uh, militarized activity of him planting a nuclear missile on the farmland, I would begin to think about these issues as, as I uh, moved into my undergraduate and then graduate studies, this sense of the affection towards the land is what brought me in my, my first encounter with First Nations, Native American peoples, indigenous peoples, and that sense of affection for the land. And quite frankly, it was my early romanticism, a kind of loving relationship with the image of Native people as having this re effective relationship with the land. And as I began to study and read, I learned a history. And it was indigenous teachers who first began to awaken me to the understanding that the modernity that we lived in, the modernity that brought nuclear proliferation and the industrial extractive economy that was pumping heat trapping gases into the atmosphere, it was indigenous teachers who began to alert me to the sense that modernity in all of its ongoing activities brought forms of colonization and that this colonized modernity had been thrust and imposed upon native peoples first and very strongly. And so I began to think about what, where did uranium come from and where were the mines? And I began to realize as indigenous teachers would begin to talk about all of the mining in the West, a majority of it on Native American lands in the West, both in the US and Canada, and that sense of that extractive economy coming out of this colonized modernity, which presented nuclear militarization as a patriotic act. It was simply collapsed into that form. And so the whole planting of the middle missile base on our farm was caught up in that confrontation in our own thinking. Was our uh, opposal uh, an act of uh, against patriotism or should we be simply good patriots and go along with the process as my family fought it much longer than other families in the region. But this sense then of the, the uh, imposition of extractive activities on native people is in concert with that long history as I began to understand it of how colonial activities affirmed by the church in the papal bulls and the doctrine of discovery and then woven into patriotism, woven into the emergence of the nation state. And these uh, activities then, all of a sudden my, I began to realize that these two massive projects now of nuclear proliferation and of the extraction and use of fossil fuels, pumping heat trapping gases into our atmosphere, that these two massive assaults on the planet also are connected with the modernized colonialism that we have now brought upon ourselves. Dominant societies feel now what native peoples have felt also for so many centuries, the sense of an overwhelming burden placed by this uh, ec underlying economic agenda that is um, uh, presented as the betterment of people and betterment of the planet by nuclear protection, by militarization, and by a capitalist extractive economy that is bent on maintaining itself at any cost to the planet. So it's with this sense that I, I want to reflect with everyone that I, I come to sense what happened at that table into the very present is the fear that's generated by this militarized colonial mindset that we fear the other. We fear and we build our military presence by an ungrounded fear of the other. And then also in the climate sense, we, we cannot even talk about it clearly because we fear the transformation that it calls leaving fossil fuel economy behind. And what, what I see confronting us is again, what I felt with I, when I walked with family back to the family farm, that my father's health 
so driven and so diseased by the anxiety of these issues that when he would step upon the land of the farm, I could feel his healing take place. And so also our recovery of our community relationship with the land, the earth community, our recovering with the giving earth, our sense then of recovering a healing presence. That's my story that I take of these two issues. They are very dark moments in our historical, but they also open to us a possibility. There are potentialities for new healing. Thank you, John. Uh, very moving, I must say. And you know, we've been married for over 40 years. And I have to tell you, this particular webinar brought out that story from John, because I hadn't even heard the story in that kind of way. So this is the, the gift, isn't it, of our moment, where we're trying to come into real stories, real experiences. And that's what I want to share with you as well. Um, you know, when I went to Japan in 1973-74 to teach at a university there, and it really changed my life in so many ways, I began to be terribly interested in Asian religions, and that became eventually my specialty in studies, because I saw a different world and a different worldview, not to say it's perfect, there's no society or culture that is, but when I went in April of 1973 to Hiroshima, I was transformed forever. I will never, ever forget the experience of being there, going through the museum, speechless with the suffering that was evident. And then in 1974, I was there for almost two years, and I went to Nagasaki. And as well, the devastation is unspeakable. And we all know bits about it, uh, Black Rain that John Hershey wrote and so on. But somehow being on that land uh, that was sacred in the ways John's just describing uh, and has been so devastated. And yet, of course, a massive peace movement has come out of Japan, of these regions and the, um, the renewal each year in August to uh, think about that around the planet is very, very significant. So the other story I want to share is the Catholic worker movement that I mentioned. My grandparents were very close to Dorothy Day, who was a founder of the Catholic worker movement, very much involved in peace and anti-nuclear issues and, and so on, um, and also care for the poor in the Lower East Side of New York, uh, the homeless, and so on. But the Catholic worker movement in recent years, as you know, I think have, has been very active in the nuclear uh, protest movements and so on. And some of that began with the Berrigan brothers, the Catonsville uh, incident and the trial of the Catonsville Nine, the burning of draft cards, the protest against the uh, Vietnam War. And I was involved in the Buffalo Five at the same um, little bit later in uh, the 70s. But what I want to mention in particular is the number of demonstrations and witnesses that Catholic workers have given at different sites across the US uh, on this issue. And one of um, our dear friends, our favorite people is Megan Rice, who's a holy child nun, um, whose mother uh, was a good friend of my grandparents. And in 19... Uh, in, it, it, sorry, in 2012, in July 28th, at 82 years old, she went in to one of the supposedly most secure areas for nuclear weapons development in the country, and that is the Oak Ridge uh, complex called Y-12. And she and two others did a ritual and prayers and so on um, to protest this site where the bombs came out of this particular site in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. They were arrested, they went to jail, she served two years, uh, and so on. And I was a character witness for her trial a year later, uh, in May of 2013, in Tennessee. And I want to say, uh, witnessing her coming into the, the, uh, the court in shackles, in prison garb, and so on, along with her two protesters, uh, was a riveting 
really horrific experience, actually. And I felt during that whole trial, I was in the midst of a most oh, dark military industrial complex. There were generals who cited these two places, who head up these two places. So the military uh, uh, was involved with the industrial complex. And I said to one general who had just testified, do you realize that Ramsey Clark, our attorney general uh, in the earlier years, has a very important testimony that we are against the non-proliferation treaties by what we are doing with creating and refurbishing nuclear weapons. And he said, no, I'm not aware of it. He didn't know who Nate Ramsey Clark was or anything. Um, and the kind of denial and ignorance was so shocking. And I said, are you aware that Ramsey Clark's testimony isn't even allowed in this trial? So he was not, the levels of corruption, et cetera, are mind boggling. And I just want to say, you know, we all know statistics and so on, but I want to highlight um, just for a few minutes here, the financial costs the, <laughs> of building and maintaining and now refurbishing these weapons is astronomical, as you all know, um, versus the human needs that are now evident in a pandemic time of health, of education, of jobs, uh, and so on, and of diplomacy with other nations. The safety risks, again, we're aware of the short-term health effects on people and land, native peoples in the Southwest who with uranium mining and with testing have suffered enormously, as has people in the Nevada um, region, the downwinders, and the long-term ultimate destruction of our planetary life. I want to point out that there's a new uh, website called US Nuclear Excess website, which will give you some of these figures. Um, we know there's 13,400 weapons now in 2020, the last count. Um, and there are plans, regrettably, in the US to expand the nuclear arsenal. Um, to, and over the next decade, the Congressional Budget Office projects the U.S. will spend $500 billion to maintain and replace its nuclear arsenal. Over 30 years, the cost could top $1.5 trillion. The 2020 National Defense Authorization Act authorizes the U.S. government to spend $750 billion on military programs, and that uh, we, we know now. And compared to the spending of all other nations, uh, the top seven countries, this is way, way more. Now, I do want to say, however, that fortunately, there's some political pushback here in the US. Just in March, there were two very significant articles on this topic, but 50 House Democrats are demanding that Biden slash the Pentagon budget and invest in health and the common good. The theme is starve the Pentagon, feed the people. Um, so this is a very, I would say, active but incipient political movement. And that is something that we can all uh, support in our own ways. I also wanted to uh, mention that what happened in the UK just recently, the article I have again is uh, March, is that Boris, uh, the, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson, unveiled a plan that would increase the size of their nuclear arsenal by up to 40%. Now, again, the peace campaigners there are pushing back, saying this is also against the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and so on. So on both sides of our English-speaking world, we have work to do, but we have activists who are very much involved in that. And I would say we need to pick up and, and join them. Now, there's several questions that Ms. Bazu gave us that I want to respond to um, very specifically. And that is, you know, how we put together a movement uh, of these nuclear issues and climate change issues. Um, and she mentioned at the very beginning that there's a lack of political interest, of course, but I'm saying uh, not, we don't have to give up on that yet. Um, but there is vacillation of policy, as, as she notes. But here's what I would suggest, that we need to build the movement with one big missing link, and that's with justice. 
Um, the Earth Charter that I was involved in the drafting process of for 10 years has three main principles, ecology, justice, and peace. Ecology and the climate change issues, the peace and disarmament issues, but the justice issues are so critical, aren't they? Social and economic justice. And we have a great example in the encyclical of Pope Francis Laudato Si, where he speaks of the cry of the earth, the cry of the poor. And that brings forward this conjunction, which frankly, in our lifetime has been somewhat absent. And it's a conjunction of people and the planet. And it's this new conjunction of the key issues that are facing us, ecology, justice, and peace. Because we know the most vulnerable are the ones who are suffering from climate change and certainly from the misplaced uh, military budgets and so on. Um, the second question was, how can we ma mainstream the issue of nuclear nonproliferation so that it can ride on the wave of the populist climate justice movement? That is a great question, because the populist climate justice movement is robust. It's not going to be stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, it's youth driven with sunshine movement, with what Ms. Basu is doing, with what many of you are doing. Extinction Rebellion out of the UK is an extraordinary movement in that regard. Um, and I would simply say we need to support in this intergenerational way these youth movements. Uh, they are fantastic and some of the most hopeful signs of our time. Greta Thunberg, but there's many Gretas, one of whom is sitting right here with us, uh, Ms. Bazu. Now, we need also scientists to speak out, and they are, we know that, and we need to partner with them. Jim Hansen, of course, has been one of the uh, long-term people in that regard, and we need religious communities. And that leads to the third question that I think is also very, very critical here and somewhat overlooked until present, and that's what's the role does faith and religions play mm -hmm. in mitigating these challenges? How can faith-based and interfaith organizations help to accel accelerate progress in nuclear disarmament and climate justice? Now, you know, even on the disarmament issue, the, the Catholic Church has so many problems and, and whatnot, but you know, sometimes it does get it right, and it does on the, these moral issues of the nuclear and climate change, fortunately, because as we grew up, Pope John, and we come from Catholic social justice, uh, progressive thinking um, that is very keen on these types of issues because Pope John the 23rd, who was very influential in our youth, wrote an encyclical called Pacem in Terrace, calling for peace on earth. So did uh, Pope John, uh, Pope Paul the sixth, very, very keen on peace issues. The US Catholic bishops have written many, many statements, including one with evangelicals uh, on this issue. The Pope in, November of 2019 was in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, made a very impassioned statement about nuclear weapons. I'll just quote a little bit. A world of peace free from nuclear weapons is the aspiration of millions of men and women everywhere. To make this ideal a reality calls for involvement on the part of all. There's a need to break down the climate of distrust. We need to ponder the catastrophic impact of their deployment, especially from a humanitarian and environmental standpoint, and reject highlighting, uh, heightening a climate of fear, mistrust, and hostility fomented by nuclear doctrines. So we do have a long tradition there. I've already mentioned um, the, some of the other movements like Catholic worker movement. But let me also say the Buddhists have been at this for a very long time um, in Japan and Southeast Asia and, and elsewhere. Here in North yes. America, there's an engaged Buddhist mm -hmm. movement, Buddhist Peace Fellowship, Joanna Macy, Gary Snyder, Stephanie Kaza, and many, many others. And on the Forum on Religion and Ecology website, I urge you to take a look uh, um, there's a section called climate emergency, which is what the Extinction Rebellion is wanting us to move towards. And they got the UK um, Parliament to vote. It is a climate uh, emergency. And shortly after the, um, the Irish Parliament, too, and, and several others. But on our website, the Forum on Religion and Ecology, there are statements from all the world's religions about the urgency 
of doing something about climate change in the environment. There are books, there are events, there's a newsletter. I hope you'll sign up for it. And also send us your events and your news or your publications. And finally, um, the question that uh, Ms. Basu raised for us is how can we use education and advocacy to build greater awareness and create an intergenerational movement to mitigate these two threats? Well, clearly a political movement is, move, is arising around both of these, these threats. I would also suggest that we look to film, to the arts, to music, to activate people, because we need hope, don't we? We need things that are positive. And so letting loose, we have most of our projects in our classes at Yale, we have creative projects at the end, and it's astonishing what yeah. these students come up with. Poems and, and short films and, and uh, little interactive videos and so on. So I think we need, to make this youth-based, as I've also said before, um, and it is already, we need to make it science-based, we need to make it religious-based, and there, as I've noted, many, many religions now that are waking up, certainly to climate change and the environment, but have a you know, uh, concern also about the nuclear issue, so we've got to find ways to join these together. And I want to end on maybe one of the most hopeful notes, and that is um, in January 2021, this treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons was actually ratified and came into force, as many of you know. Now that took three years, but it's an extraordinary accomplishment, not fully understood because the news didn't pick it up as it should and so on. But you know, let's build on that, shall we, to say if we could have such a treaty in our lifetime. And if the climate movement, let me also end on a positive note there, can have a divestment campaign of $15 trillion now, begun by people like uh, Bill McKibben and Naomi Klein and so many others, the socially responsible investment that religious communities have been supporting, that we in the academic communities are trying to get the universities to move into, um, that these protests about banks, the movement of insurance industries into this is hugely important. And finally, I just want to say on Easter dinner, I had a wonderful conversation with a major person involved in investment in alternative energies uh, working in New York. And this is confirmed by a terrific article that just came out. And he said, look, in the last 13 years, we have moved relentlessly and steadily mm -hmm. and irreversibly toward, toward alternative energies. And that is the most exciting thing mm -hmm. um, for the movement from fossil fuels to alternative and green energies. So let me end on those two hopeful notes and to say that the energies that we're all trying to evoke for a sustained movement, an intergenerational movement, for hope, for possibility, and coming back to John's point, that we live and dwell in, within a sacred earth community. Our ancestors have, future generations will, and that's what will keep us going for this transformative movement. So thank you, Ms. Bazu, for inviting us, thank and you. we look forward to some questions. Absolutely, thank you so much. That was so wonderful, and you know, the discussion today really, as you said, reflects that intergenerational solidarity and really connection with one another and with our common humanity. And it's really wonderful to hear about how these movements and the justice movements have gone on for so long. And it's also continuing now with the children and youth as well, and most importantly, from the ground up. So that is really, really amazing. And I really like how you said that justice is so important. I think people forget about the justice when they're discussing issues and they're often discussed in isolation, but that common thread that connects them is yeah. justice. And you know, when we talk about sustainability as well with the economy, society, and the environment, we talk about the, the economy and the environment, but the society and the justice part is forgotten. And that really shouldn't be the case. And, you know, with 
it's also wonderful to hear about the connection with the land and especially with the indigenous communities who for centuries, thousands of years have had that connection with uh, the land and you know, with the nuclear colonialism, climate colonialism, these are not issues that are discussed. And so often nuclear uh, energy is, uh, you know, touted as this kind of clean energy. But what people don't know is that that new clean energy comes from exploiting the lands and the people, the indigenous people. And that is just so sad. And you know, when the atomic bombs, uh, Batman and Little Boy, pe most people don't know that the uranium that was put into those bombs came from the Dene community in Canada. And like, it still affects the indigenous communities over there today because of the uh, the uranium uh, tailings that are present yeah. in the river there. So that's yeah. horrifying to uh, know. And, you know, the point about how the resources have to be directed towards helping people instead of destroying humanity, that is just so important. Uh, just to cite an example, like yesterday, Green Hope Foundation installed solar street lights and he holds solar panel grid in Liberia in the village there so that the girls who drop out of school due to sexual assault have safe spaces at night to go to school for computer literacy. And in Bangladesh, we've built toilets there and especially uh, it's so beneficial for the girls to actually to be able to go to school and have toilets there. And a lot of the time that was why they dropped out. And, you know, where are the nuclear weapons when you have to address issues like this? Where are the nuclear weapons when you have to like build, rebuild better from a pandemic? So, and even these are uh, places that are so affected by climate change induced disasters, but nuclear weapons are not doing anything to help out in that situation. So it's really something that needs to be addressed as you said, arts, education, creativity, hope, that is so important. And of course, connecting back with the land and connecting with our ancestors and just with our humanity. So thank you once again, this has been so wonderful. And I do see like a lot of questions. So we shall uh, definitely go in there. And just to say that, you know, that is the beauty of Voices for a World Free of Nuclear Weapons as well, because that is something that we, that hope for the future and working towards a common humanity. That's something that we definitely uh, see reflected in all of our work. So thank you once again. And our first question, and this is from our Zoom platform, is that we need a network of local groups, organizations, tribal peoples, and businesses who are living into this work. How do we make connections to those local groups? And is there a network of those modeling practices in local communities? And just to connect the, from the same person, I believe, um, and wondering how this work might connect with those social ecologists and even eco-anarchists who are calling for small farms, community actions, et cetera, and going back to the network idea. So over to you. Hmm. Oh, networking is crucial, isn't it? And I think many of the organizations Mary Evelyn mentioned were themselves uh, e emerged out of these kinds of network local relationships. So I think what we, we need to understand also is the, uh, the food movements, the degrowth movements, that what we share across our particular focus on issues is that we share this planetary concern. And I think this is the language now that network is building on a planetary concern. Right, and there are so many groups out there as this question um, I think suggests, but the Indigenous Environmental Network, uh, for example, would be one to connect to. And the Diné, um, the, the people's actually Hopi too in, South, uh, in, in the Southwest here in this country, um, in New Mexico, were very adversely affected and so on. But again, on our website, there's what we call engaged projects. So we have all the world's religions listed there with their statements and, and their books and their events, but there's also the highlighting engaged projects on the ground. So I suggest you go there, meaning grassroots, religiously, morally based projects that are doing all kinds of work of restoration of forests, of, of salmon runs and fisheries and uh, rivers and, and things like that. That's part of, you know, this is going to be the UN decade for or it's UN year, I forget, I think it's decade on restoration. And I really mm -hmm. want to highlight that that is something that's bringing together indigenous 
a traditional environmental knowledge and scientific knowledge for these kinds of restoration projects, which are very exciting. I don't know if you yeah. want to add to well, that. Well, we're just beginning to realize also the relationship between these types of media technologies that enable networking across very instantaneous communication. But we also need to step outdoors. We need to be in the local moment of the spring as, a, as we have it today. So this is a challenge also, I think, how to network where we find local commi commitment and we're also not simply entranced by this medium, but we're enabling uh, the work to go forward uh, through using this medium. And I think just one other thing the questioner mentioned um, sort of, I think it was social anarchist groups, maybe Murray Bookchin was uh, part of that effort years ago. Um, you know, I think there are lots of back to the land movement still. Um, and I don't, wouldn't want to rule any out, but I think, I do think, uh, you know, the Occupy movement suffered a bit from uh, the influence of anarchy, I, I believe, um, in that the, we have to find ways, don't we, of inclusive democratic processes that also have a sense of direction and movement forward. So just wanted to mention that. Absolutely. Yeah, it is about involving all sectors of society and, you know, demonizing a certain sector is not going to work. You need to yeah. actually include everyone's voices, see where they're coming from and then try to ensure that we are able to satisfy everyone's needs, the planet's needs, humanity's needs. But yes, I think that is like a really important uh, point. And let's uh, thank you so much for those responses. The next question is, and this is from our Facebook Live, what do nations do with old outdated nuclear weapons? Like where do they dump them? Isn't that in itself a huge danger, especially in nuclear nations like Pakistan, India, or North Korea, where the laws are not implemented strictly? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. These are security issues that common citizens like ourselves in Canada and the United States are not always given uh, adequate information. We do know that from nuclear reactors uh, producing energy, that there are waste uh, dimensions to it, which have very uh, significant security risk and storage risks. And so this question is an excellent question. What is going on at Hanford uh, nuclear area in Washington state? Wh where is the storage of spent military nuclear activity? So this is, for me at least, this is an unclear uh, response to a very good question. Yeah, I would just agree uh, with John. It's such an important question. Um, I don't know if Colleen Driscoll is on this uh, webinar and she might want to weigh in because she's exceedingly knowledgeable about this. Um, but I think, so, th so to be honest, um, you know, we are not sure, and that's part of the problem, as, as your question uh, highlights, but we're not sure of so many things about this industry and uh, about its contracts with um, yeah. all Lockheed and Grumman and so on and so forth. It's, it's a huge industry, right? And years ago, I had a file like this on the Yucca Mountain, uh, which was supposed to be a repository for nuclear waste here in the US. And it went on and on. The cost of just uh, trying to research that was far more than the cost of building it. And it's never been built because it's a completely unreliable um, place. And, you know, out in the Pacific, this um, Rennet Dome um, mm, yes. is cracking and radioactive uh, materials are going into the uh, Pacific Ocean and so on. It was constructed in 1977 as a temporary place. So, and, and this was with regard to testing, testing materials in the Pacific. Yes. So that's one response to the question of uh, uh, some decades back. Yeah, but the nuclear uh, plants here in the U.S., they have to keep their waste there. Uh -huh. And then you start to think about transportation and so on and so forth. So, and then the nuclear weapons waste, too, is uh, astronomical and not yes. dealt with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And again, it's like the nuclear waste goes again into the indigenous lands and 
it goes could just continues the cycle of nuclear colonialism so yes and i think you actually your response brought up a very great point and that is there isn't enough transparency in terms of how nations are dealing with their nuclear weapons and their weapons of mass destruction when honestly when you have literally these sources and weapons of mass destruction transparency is key because you hold the well you hold humanity's fate in your hands so it is really sad to note that there isn't that transparency as yet and it threatens all of our safety so again thank you for your responses i see another question on our facebook live and that is there are gender impacts due to both of these issues, climate and nuclear weapons. And how can we ensure that in our movements, we can keep a focus on this, and especially in the nuclear disarmament movement where it's almost completely ignored? Yeah, I wish the person could elaborate that a little bit more, because um, I'm not sure everything that she's referring to, but um, certainly, we can say there's health issues <laughs> for yeah. uh, for women and nuclear uh, exposure that's huge. And people like Terry Tempest Williams, a great writer here in the West, her mother died of um, the downwind testing in Nevada. And many, many people, um, especially women, have had health issues from that kind of exposure. So I'm not sure if that's the nature of the question, but you were going to say something well, too. Well, I'm struck by the uh, insights that were raised with the last question and the sense of a queering approach to these issues where we open ourselves to understand what's being, uh, uh, what's absent and what's present? What do we know and what do we don't know? And why are these issues related in this way? So I think a gender approach also opens us uh, up to look for the uh, unexpected, the non-normative issues that are uh, uh, actually significant entries into understanding things like storage, or like uh, uh, the uh, materials that are spent and uh, then are simply move into an absence frame. We don't know what is has much as masked in this regard. Yeah, and if I could maybe pick up um, a couple things that uh, certainly are clear about the impact for women in terms of the climate uh, emergency. And that is, um, you know, in this country, the man camps, the abuse of women, and certainly for Native American women, uh, the disappearance of women by this industry moving across the plains with just a horrific sense of entitlement of uh, male privilege and so on. So the abuse of women is very, very clear. Uh, but as well, I would say the camps of refugees um, across the Middle East and in the Greek islands and so on, uh, is one of them, I wake up many mornings thinking when I take a glass of water, what about the women in these refugee camps trying to get water for their children or their families and so on. And again, the, the abuse, uh, as, as we know, um, is, is horrific, but just survival uh, for women and their families. And why these camps, why these refugee camps? Because of climate disaster. The Syrian civil war is due to a huge drought where farmers could not raise their crops and came into the cities and so on. And the, the droughts across North Africa and the inability to mm -hmm. make a living has caused climate refugees of 90 million people and the same at our borders here in the South. So we must deal with the climate emergency and its impact on humans. And that's why justice is so critical. Absolutely, yes. And, you know, Green Hope Foundation works in the Syrian refugee camps as well as in the Rohingya refugee camps. And you're absolutely right. It is it is the women and the girls who are impacted the most. And, you know, it's horrifying. It's heartbreaking. Like I always say that when I first entered the Syrian refugee camp, I could literally hear my heart breaking because it, it was just horrifying that it was something that was brought about by war, that was brought about by a climate change induced disaster. And it has such a gendered impact. And I think that's, you know, for all of our world's challenges, there is this unequal disproportionate impact on women and girls that uh, needs to be addressed. I'm really glad you brought up that point. 
And another point that I was actually going to bring up uh, later on was the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And actually, I see a question on our Zoom platform uh, platform from Ted Stage who asks about that. So his question is, the UN Sustainable Development Goals for 2030 are more urgent than ever in light of the devastating results of a global pandemic. Can we reaffirm our hope for the future of the planet by recognizing that all the local actions on eco-justice and peace may help us reconnect with the highest aspirations of the 193 nations expressed in the SDGs? Are not most actions towards global peace and justice contributing to fulfilling those goals without knowing it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are on the ground possibilities, the SDGs open pathways. And I, I want to just bring the voice of the religions of the world and the values that they have fostered over centuries, that these are the portals that the religions of the world also need to enter into. We need to bring serious attention mm -hmm. to these uh, possibilities. And actually, one of the very specific things that we're doing in that regard of what's called FBOs, faith-based organizations, <clears throat> and the SDGs, um, there is a document that we're about to launch on our Forum on Religion and Ecology website at Yale, which um, illustrates precisely how the religious communities are weighing in and assisting on achieving these goals, not all of them clearly, but many of them. And that uh, platform will allow other religious communities to weigh in with their projects and their connection to these SDGs. And I also want to mention, so that's an exciting, um, yeah. I think, and very available way of illustrating what the religious communities are doing. And in September, I was just on a phone call yesterday, um, you know, there's many, many exciting things happening in the religious communities. Um, this, she was telling me about what WWF, World Wildlife Fund, is doing to elevate religions for conservation. And in September, along with many uh, communities working in this space, they're going to announce hundreds, if not thousands, of projects around the world that will commit to long-term change. Laudato Si is doing the same thing, inviting communities. They have a five-year plan of engaging religious communities, not only Catholics, but on these kinds of uh, transformative changes. Mm -hmm. So it's very exciting. The World um, Resources Institute, based in Washington, DC, a very high-level think tank, is starting a faith and sustainability initiative. And they've gotten a huge grant to do it. I'm quite amazed. Um, so, and then another one I want to mention is United Nations yes. Environment Program, yes. um, Faith for Earth. Yes. And that is actually, um, do I have it here? Uh, th that is a very exciting project because to have the UN take on board the notion mm. that religious communities can make a difference is terrific. They've come out with a booklet called Faith for Earth, which you can find. And we'll tell us. And it's such in such capable hands in the leadership of uh, Iyad Abu Mowgli. Yeah. that he is of energetic and uh, bringing these issues forward in very intelligent ways. They just published this Faith for Earth, which uh, we helped with, but the, with the Parliament of World Religions. Mm -hmm. And um, they, we are going to use it in our mm -hmm. MOOCs, Massive Open Online Classes. But this is available online. It's fantastic. Pictures, visually. visually. Yeah. It's got the science and it's got the major teachings of the world's religions. Mm. So I recommend it highly. Yes, absolutely. I think, and that's a really relevant question. And my answer to that is, you know, yes, absolutely. Because oh. every single action on the ground, even top down relates to the SDGs and its targets. And, you know, it's about, again, it's about justice at the end because those actions are so interconnected that the end of the day it is about people, planet, prosperity, uh, peace and partnerships and leaving no one behind and ensuring a life of dignity for all. So that is a very relevant question and very relevant responses. And uh, just right at the end, we actually do have a response from Colleen Driscoll who says Good. nuclear waste is the issue that is not being fully investigated. And there are waste sites, but they are porous 
In the known sites, there is runoff into water sources with harm to the public. Nuclear waste was sunk into the sea in oil cans, which eventually began to rust and break open. We need a whole movement to ask these questions before long-term danger is almost beyond repair. So thank, thank you, you so much, uh, Colleen, for that. And just to add that there are like books, movies, TV shows about these dystopian futures that literally have situations like this, but when it's happening to us in real life, we are ignoring it. Why? I have no idea, but it should be addressed. But we are, we are running out of time. So unfortunately we won't be able to take any more questions, but I would like to thank our audience and our amazing panelists for uh, the questions, the responses. And honestly, this has been such a wonderfully enlightening and thought provoking discussion. And I can't thank you, Mary Evelyn, John, for enough for sharing your experiences, your views, your expertise with us today. And of course, thank you to our audience for your participation, your questions that made the discussion even more engaging. And I, you know, it's about what we take away from here, what new actions that we take, what current initiatives that we now must expand upon that will really alter the status quo. And one thing is for certain, I think that we must catalyze this movement and this moment to do things differently. And only then can we expect different outcomes. The possibilities are clearly there ahead of us and was lucidly evident from our discussion today. And at the end of the day, it's all about taking definitive steps and it's incumbent on each one of us to make that effort because it's our future that is in the balance. And you know, with that, with something that is so relevant to us at Voices today and just before we conclude, Voices Youth has a very special announcement. So uh, let's see the video for that. Beginning today, each year, there will be a young person designated to receive the Voices Youth Award in honor of Mikhail Gorbachev and George Shultz. We, the youth, are the present and the future, but that continues to be threatened by nuclear weapons. Weapons of mass destruction affect everyone, regardless of their age. We know that youth are stepping up to do their bit for nuclear disarmament. If you are a young person, who is passionate, hardworking, and honest, and working towards nuclear disarmament. Apply today. Second Voices Youth Award. Honoring the legacy of Mikhail Gorbachev and George Shultz. This is not just an award. It's a hope. It's an aspiration. For a, for a peaceful and nuclear weapons-free world. Amazing. That's wonderful. Congratulations. Really I just wonderful. love it. And I just wanted to say, if you don't mind, first of all, we really want to thank you for your extraordinary work. Mm. And this is a very exciting piece of it. And we look forward to working with you together and with the other youth. And I want to just invite people to go to our website, which is for .yale.edu, and maybe you can share that later. And also that we're going to be doing MOOCs, these massive open online courses for Coursera on world religions and ecology, and we hope to feature youth voices uh, from time to time there. So we're so grateful for the work that you're doing, and Wonderful. may you succeed and continue and flourish. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. And, you know, with the official launch of the second annual Voices Youth Award in honor of Mikhail Gorbachev and George Schultz. We are actually honored that you are also here with us today. And it is about inviting passionate young people to apply because again, as was said by our amazing uh, girls in the video, it is it affects nuclear weapons, affects everyone. And it's so connected with the other issue that we discussed today, that is climate change. But thank you so much, Dr. Tucker, Dr. Grimm, for sharing your 
perspectives with us today. And at the end of the day, we have to remember that this is one battle that we cannot afford to lose because humanity is at stake and it will require the passion and uh, the love for Mother Earth, for humanity that we all embody here today and th that our audience does as well, that it, that it will require that collaboration to create the future that we all want. So thank you once again. We look forward to working together to amplify our options for creating the world we want. That's a climate just and nuclear weapons free world. Please stay safe. Take very good care of your loved ones and yourselves. And we thank should you. see you soon at our next event. On behalf of the Voices Youth team, thank you everyone and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.